know me and my son are big fans of anything sci-fi fantasy related. So, on Netflix, there's this new sci-fi Sherlock Holmes story. And I clicked on it to watch it for the first time, the irregulars. And the very first scene is this girl walking through bones. When we see piles of bones, it's usually a scene of horror, right? Like you are watching a horror movie, you're watching uh, a movie like Rwanda, where the man gets out of his jeep and is just walking over piles of bodies. When we see piles of bones, we know that something bad has happened, right? that something horrible has occurred. And so in this passage from Ezekiel, we know that to be at a place where there is a huge pile of bones, that something has gone terribly wrong, right? That for the prophets, the prophets were written during times in which Israel is exiled, right? That they have been taken over by another country and have been pushed into a new land, maybe even had their people dragged into that new land. In the process of doing that, of another country coming in and taking over, there are often piles of bones because of all the fighting that has occurred. And so when God brings Ezekiel to that pile of bones, it's an image of the prophet coming to a place of tragedy and fear and death, right? And so God says to Ezekiel, mortal, can these bones live? Now you all have Easter for your reference point, so you know that God can make those bones live. Ezekiel isn't there yet, right? But Ezekiel is very diplomatic, and he says, Lord, only you know. So then God tells Ezekiel to prophesy. So the entire book of Ezekiel is those encounters where God has told Ezekiel to give the word to the people, to tell them what they need to hear in order to move forward in their lives. And in this case, God is asking Ezekiel to preach to those bones, to tell them to come back to life. He even gives him the exact words to say. He says, tell them to rise up and that the sinew and muscle and flesh will come upon the bones. And then the breath will come into them. So Ezekiel does what he always does, ends in the prophetic word he always says, that the Lord can make this happen. And those bones, like you're in a horror film, stand up and start growing, right? They start growing the muscle and the flesh. And so now Ezekiel has standing before him like zombies, right? Because they aren't moving. It's just a body now standing there in front of him. And God says, you need to tell them to breathe. And so Ezekiel tells them to breathe. That the wind of God is coming within them, that God's breath will pour out from within them. And the story ends not with dancing, not with celebration. Like many of these prophecies where something wonderful and exotic and strange and mystifying happens, end with singing and celebration and praise, right? In this case, it ends with God saying, those bones, you, the house of Israel, you, the bones, 
are afraid to live, afraid to breathe. As I've been sitting with this scripture this week, it struck me that that this scripture isn't necessarily about death and rebirth. It's more about despair and fear. That the Israelites are afraid to be alive, afraid to move forward, afraid of new life happening in their midst. They're trapped in their despair and fear. And we can understand this, right? I mean, I just preached you through the book of Daniel with you, right? With the people who were in exile. And how do they get out of exile? And how do they live in the midst of people telling them what they have to do and how they have to be that contradicts their own understanding of who God calls them to be, right? And in that, the majority of those people, those young people that were pulled away from their homes and placed into a system to transform them and change them into the empire they are now a part of, we have Daniel and his friends. And Daniel and his friends refuse to change and transform into that system. But what gave them that courage? That courage to live in a system that was telling them to choose things that weren't as, as God had told them to live. And that's where this passage of Ezekiel is also. Israel has been invited into new life, into new breath, into experiencing the holy, into being alive again. And yet they're afraid. On March 27th, Pew Research dropped a poll that said for the first time since they have been taking their polls, 47% of the people claim to be worshiping faithful Christians and attending church. From about the 50s until the mid-80s, 70% of the population of the United States answered yes to that question, that they were faithful and attended worship. We're down to 47%. And all of us are looking around, and we're seeing the 47% amongst us in worship right now. And while on, our, on Facebook there are about 11 people watching right now, it feels like we're that Israel remnant, right? That last little bit, because in the 80s, you also had 70%, right? You had a full church here that seemed full, not just on Christmas and Easter. And now we're down to the remnant. How do we live in this space where once, what once was isn't anymore? And we don't know what will be which is easy to understand those bones just standing there. Because taking that first step into the unknown is scary. To take that first step and sing and dance and praise is even scarier, right? How do we learn to take that first step? How do we learn to exist in a world that has changed from what we have always seen as comfortable. And know that there's no going back. That COVID has just accelerated that change. What 
it doesn't mean that we are the bones. It doesn't mean that we have to remain the bones. It doesn't mean that we have to be trapped in fear and despair. Because when I think about you and the stories you share with me, about how you used to be, and then about the troubles, you tell me about the troubles. The problems that have happened because this minister did this, and then this minister did this, and then this minister did this, and each time along the way, We lost more people. Until it feels like we're the last ones left, right? The only ones still standing. And what the world doesn't see when they look at us is that you as a congregation, because I've heard your stories when I've gone to visit, have changed from the people you used to be. The way you used to talk about the church suppers is a classic example. The ladies who used to run it were very firm and in control and told you exactly how it had to be done. Right? I mean, they were very precise about the way everything had to happen. And it worked. Everything got done. You served lots of people. Now, when we get together and have a supper and work, what I see and hear is conversations about what's happening in your life, is laughter and joy. That, that what used to be very stern and doubt has become this space of comfort and joy to each other. How do we share that, yes, we're different, but the life that we have is new? That the life that we have has changed and transformed, that we have become a stronger, more resilient people, that we have become full of laughter and hope. And yet the statistics are real, right? that there are fewer people, and we can see that just looking around. And that's where there's an interesting thing that happens in Ezekiel 37 that you probably didn't notice. And you wouldn't necessarily notice unless you read it in the Hebrew. That within those verses, and specifically in four verses, the word breath is used nine times with different words. God tells Ezekiel to have them breathe. God tells him to invite the wind, another word for breath, to come. God tells those bones to breathe again. That in the midst of despair, the breath of God is closer than you could ever imagine. That the breath of God is there within you. That the breath has always been and always will be with you. That God's breath is flowing through you and with you and is constantly there. But sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we are scared to acknowledge that breath, that blowing wind of God, the root hot coming within us, filling us up, and allowing us, as the Pentecost story shares, when the breath comes into those disciples, to dream and vision and dance a new life and a new hope and a new courage that the world can be different that our life together can grow and be bountiful. May the breath of God fill you. May you
you be overflowing with the wind of God pouring through you. Amen.